In this recording, I'm going to talk about a couple of big issue topics related to stockholders' equity. The first one is just stockholders' equity and the changes that take place in each of these stockholders' equity accounts. And even though it's not required, usually most companies will show a schedule of changes in stockholders' equity. And it often looks like this horizontal model where it has the contributed capital accounts, uh, the common stock and preferred stock, and recall, recall those are always issued, uh, reported, not issued, uh, but those two accounts show par value. And then uh, if it's sold above par, that excess amount goes in the paid in capital and excess of par value. So if we have a common stock for preferred stock, and then we also have a paid in capital for the treasury stock account, uh, that's when you know we bought, bought, we bought our stock and it became treasury stock, and then we sell it back at a, uh, at a gain, so to speak. So that goes in this additional paid in capital treasury stock. Okay, and then, uh, so that's one kind of stockholder's equity account. The second category is retained earnings, treasury stock, uh, which uh, is a negative or contra stockholder's equity account, and then lastly, this accumulated other comprehensive income. Your book also looks at minority shareholders' interest. Because that's beyond the scope of, of uh, Chapter 15, I did not include that here. You will get to that in your advanced accounting course. Okay, well, let's look at retained earnings. We start, you know, it's always a positive, or it's not always, but it usually is a positive amount unless we have a deficit. But we can adjust that beginning balance for a couple of things. One is this item here for prior period adjustments. Prior period adjustments are errors that we found in financial statements from previous uh, years or accounting periods. So if we go back and make a correction for prior years, we have to, you know, we need to catch that up in the current retained earnings. So if it was a gain, we add it. If it's a loss, we subtract it. So again, prior period adjustments are correcting financial statements from previous years. There's also this cumulative effect of a change in accounting principle. That's not an error, but it also affects prior periods. So if we go back to prior periods and make adjustments plus or minus because of change like in from, you know, FIFO or from LIFO to FIFO or whatever it might be, um, we need to do a catch up for this current retained earnings. Okay, so we go in and restate. So we're going to have common stock and its additional paid in capital in excess of par, preferred stock at par, plus the additional paid in capital. Uh, we can have paid in capital from treasury stock. Hopefully we have a positive for retained earnings. Treasury stock's a negative, and this accumulated other comprehensive income can be a plus or a minus. And just another point, this treasury stock is going to be, you know, reflecting the cost of the treasury stock whereas the, the common stock and preferred stock represent par value. Okay, well over here are just items or activities that affect these accounts. Net income causes retained earnings to go up. If it had been a net loss, it would cause it to go down. Dividends reduce retained earnings because dividends are a distribution of earnings. So that's why we reduce retained earnings. If we issue common stock, we put par value in the common stock and the excess goes in the additional paid in capital for common stock. So if it's sold at a, what I'll call a premium, that premium amount goes in the additional paid in capital. And the same thing for preferred stock. You know, par is going to go into the stock account, and then the premium, the additional amount, goes into the paid in capital preferred stock. If we purchase treasury stock, Right? That's a negative to stockholders' equity, and again, that's going to represent cost of the treasury stock, not par value. Now, if we take this treasury stock that we purchased and resell it to the public, if we res resell it again, uh, well, first off, we're going to you know, take it out, so we take cost out of treasury stock, so if it went in you know, as a negative stockholders' equity, we take it out as a positive. If it sold it again, then that gain goes into this additional paid in capital treasury stock. And again, a quote gain because we don't report it as a gain. So, you know, if we purchased the shares at $100 each and turn around and sold them for 101, 
then you know we're going to take a hundred dollars out of treasury stock and put one dollar in uh, the additional paid in capital treasury stock if we had sold it at ninety seven dollars again we take cost out of treasury stock and then it depends there's a three dollar loss here uh, you know I'm going to subtract out to the extent there is a balance so uh, again the gain goes in the additional paid in capital if there is a loss we're going to take it out of paid in capital to the extent there is a balance so I can only subtract it enough to zero it out I can't subtract it so much that I have a negative balance because that doesn't make sense right how can you have negative contributed capital can't either you contributed or you didn't but you can't do negative so I can only bring this down to zero and if I need another account to balance then I take it to retained earnings okay so if there is a loss uh, I first take it to additional paid in capital treasury stock to the extent there's a balance and then anything beyond that goes to retained earnings okay and then lastly these unrealized remember unrealized means we haven't received cash realized in accounting means cash so if we haven't cashed out on selling securities it's because we are holding I didn't mean to scratch that out we are holding the securities so if I'm holding them I haven't sold them I've, I've got them on hand uh, but there can be an economic gain or loss because the market price might have gone up or it might have gone down uh, so if I have these economic gains and losses but they're not realized because I haven't actually sold it that goes into this other comprehensive income so again the gain causes it to go up the loss causes it to go down and you know so then you know we're going to end up with these items hopefully plus uh, if we have a balance there it's a minus and this can be a plus or minus and of course usually you'll total that over to get a total stockholders equity okay. now the last thing uh, I want to point out uh, these ending balances so if I for preferred stock if I want to know the total issue price of stock then I would add the common stock account right I take the common stock account plus its additional paid in capital and excess of par that tells me how much did the stock sell for in total and the same thing with preferred stock if I want to know the total issue or selling price of that stock I just add these two accounts together the other topic I want to look at is financing uh, be, this is actually a finance issue but as accountants you really need to have an understanding of it because it also affects the accounting uh, here we have a company the balance sheets just broken out between current and non-current for the assets and liabilities so just a quick note here um, if I added these two up our total liabilities here would be hundred and sixty five thousand dollars so broken out that way and I really want to talk about you know a company when it's financing its assets it really has two choices we can finance assets with debt or we could finance the assets with equity because right both of these total to you know this totals three hundred twenty five thousand dollars this column totals three hundred twenty five thousand dollars so the question is you know do I finance these assets with debt or equity and so we really kind of want to look at well what's the cost of financing each way well the cost of financing with debt if you thought about it well what would be interest so if I finance if I borrow money I have to pay interest on it now if I finance with equity which is stock and other owners equity stuff what's the cost for doing that so what do I pay my shareholders dividends so either way we have a cost either I'm paying interest to my creditors or dividends to my shareholders but here's the catch dividends are optional as a corporation I legally do not have to pay dividends I don't have, the corporation doesn't have to pay dividends dividends only become a legal liability remember from chapter 15 when they're declared so it doesn't become a legal liability until the board of directors declares the dividend so dividends are optional so that is going to make some differences so here we have uh, you know the company is actually going to they need a hundred thousand dollars and they're going to either issue bonds or stock 
So let's kind of go through this. Uh, you know, here's our, let's issue, let's schedule out what's the original data that we have. So originally we have $100,000 of current assets and we have $225,000 of non-current assets. Liabilities, uh, current liabilities are $65,000 and non-current are 160,000. So in stockholders equity, 100,000. You know, so, so what do we want to look at? So actually, I'm going to take these two ratios that I've already listed there. We're actually going to look at the current ratio. So that's current assets divided by current liabilities. So if I take $100,000 current asset, divide by the $65,000 of current liabilities, I'll get a current ratio of 1.54. 1.54 times. That means there are 1.45 times as many current assets are there as current liabilities. Or another way of thinking about it is for, you know, uh, for every uh, for every dollar of current liability, I have a dollar fifty four current assets. For every one dollar of current liability, there is a dollar fifty four of current assets to cover that. So that's healthy, isn't it? I have plenty of current assets to cover my short term liabilities. And you know, really, you know, if I look at it from a balance sheet perspective. Uh, you know, if I've got these current liabilities of $65,000, you know, how am I going to come up with the money, the cash, to pay for these? Well, those are likely to come from my current assets. So when I'm looking at the balance sheet, that's one reason it's broken out between current and non-current, um, non is so that the reader can see uh, these short-term debt, short-term assets are going to be used to pay those off. We also want to look at the, re the level of how much of the assets are financed with debt? So we want to know, you know, we've got of all these assets, you know, how much is financed with debt versus equity? So we're going to take uh, our total debt, which is $165,000 total debt, divided by uh, our total assets. So again, we have $325,000 is our total assets. So I'm going to take the $165,000 of liabilities, which is this, divide by my total assets, 325000 and I'll get 69%. So 69% of the assets are financed with debt, which means then, right, 31% are financed with stockholders' equity then. So if 69% are financed with debt, the other 31% would have to be financed with equity. So we have more debt financing. So, uh, so what does that mean? Well, if I have more debt financing, uh, that means I'm relying on, in the future, having to pay interest. So if I finance with debt, there's more risk, actually more financial, I should put that there, more financial risk, because in the future I have to pay interest. The portion finance with equity, I don't, I, you know, I may have dividends in the future, I may not. So I can control whether I have to pay dividends or not to a certain extent. I realize some of that can become quite political, but legally, I don't have, the corporation would not have to pay dividends. So because debt carries interest that's not optional, it's a fixed cost, it's fixed, I have to pay it, it carries more financial risk. So this corporation has some financial risk just starting out. Okay, so let's look at option one. Option one has us issue bonds. So if we issue bonds, you know, $100,000 of cash is going to come in, so current assets will go up to $200,000. Nothing happens to non-current assets. Nothing happens to current liabilities. But we will issue bonds, which is a current, excuse me, which is a long-term or non-current liability. So current assets will go up, cash will come in, right? So we'll have cash come in, and we will have bonds payable. Bonds payable cause non-current liabilities to go up to two hundred sixty thousand, 
and then nothing happens to stockholders' equity. It'll stay at 100,000. Okay, well, let's go do our ratios then and see what difference we have. So now I'm going to take current assets of 200,000, divide by current liabilities, and I get 3.08. Wow, that is really high, isn't it? Or so it seems, because for every $1 current liability, I would have $3.08 and eight cents of current assets. So we're, the current liabilities are well covered. Now let's look at our total debt. So I'm going to take these two numbers, which is 325,000, and divide by these total assets, which is 425,000. So 325 divided by 425 will give us a 76%. So if we issue with issue bonds, we are increasing our financial risk. So more financial risk. So that's going to elevate that. Okay. Um, so let's schedule out what I've got. Uh, currently, we had a current, starting out, we had a current ratio of one, whoop, get this to work, 1.54 and a debt to asset ratio of 69%. If we issue bonds, that has a positive impact on the current ratio, but a somewhat negative impact on the debt to asset ratio. Now let's issue stock. So if we issue common stock, and again I'm going back to our original, we would have had 100,000, cash would have come in of 100,000, so 100,000 starting, we're going to add another 100,000, and we would have 200,000 as our ending. Uh, nothing would happen to non-current, so it would stay at 225. So again, starting with that beginning, nothing happens, and there's our ending. Also, nothing would happen to current liabilities. So those continue to stay at 65,000. Non-current this time, nothing would happen to liability. So it start out with 160, nothing would happen, and it would stay at 160,000. Okay, so the only thing that changed here is cash. But now stockholders' equity is also going to go up for the common stock. So cash comes in, common stock goes up. So we started with 100,000, and we're going to end up with 200,000. So when we start with 100, add 100 to 200,000. Okay, now let's go over and do our ratios. So current ratio, current assets 200,000 divided by 65,000, we will continue to have the 3.08. Total debt, so I'm going to add these two accounts, so 325,000 is our total debt, divide by our total assets, that's 425, so 325 divided by 425 will get 53%. So if I compare that to original, our risk will go down from the beginning. Okay, let's go put these numbers in. So current, to start with, here's our ratios. We had a positive impact on the current, but a negative impact on debt to assets. Over here, if we issue stock, 3.08, but then 53%. So this paints a picture that this looks more most advantageous. So it looks most advantageous to issue the stock because it improves the current ratio and it reduces risk through the debt to asset ratio. Okay, so if this is the case, then why issue debt then? Why finance with debt? So let's go a step further and look at the income statement and some things going on there. Okay, so uh, we have earnings before earnings before interest and taxes amount to $50,000. So under either option, on the income statement, we would have had you know, earnings before we factor in interest expense and income tax expense is $50,000. Now, if we had issued bonds, uh, there would have been $10,000 in interest. 
So we would have had interest expense, 10,000. But of course, we wouldn't have had that interest expense if we issued common stock. So our earnings, our income, before taxes would be 50 and 40. And then let's assume uh, a 30% tax rate. So 30% of 50 would be $15,000 for a net income of 35. And over here, 30% of 40 is 12,000 and a net income of 28,000. So if I just factor in profits, again, I'm really happy with issuing the stock. Okay, but let's keep going and look at the change in retained earnings. So if we issued stock, we're gonna assume there was also a $10,000 dividend which we would not have had if we issued bonds. So the change or increase in retained earnings, right? We'd have net income, 35, less the dividend. Retained earnings would go up under this option, $25,000. Whereas over here, retained earnings would go up $28,000. Hmm, now we're starting to see some advantages of debt because it causes retained earnings to go up more. And the reason it does that is because interest expense is tax deductible, right? There were some tax advantages because we got to deduct interest expense on our tax return where dividends are not tax deductible. So if we look at a return on equity, remember that's taking net income divided by stockholders' equity. So, uh, and actually that's net income minus our dividends. So that's gonna be taking, in this case, our 25,000, I'm gonna leave off the three zeros, the 25,000, let's go over to stockholders' equity here. If we issued stock, stockholders' equity was 200,000, I'm gonna leave off the three zeros just to make it a little cleaner. So 25,000, divided by 200,000 gives us an 11.1% return on equity. Now over here, retained earnings, which is net income minus my dividends, is 28,000. Let's go look at stockholders' equity. Stockholders' equity is only 100,000 this time, right? It was 200 over here, now it's only 100,000. Oops, I just caught my mistake. I need to go back and correct this over here. Uh, I'm gonna erase this real quick, the 200,000, and my apologies, but I do wanna get it right. Uh, we had stockholders equity of 200,000. However, uh, we also would have, retained earnings would have gone up 25. So that would make that 225,000. So again, let me point it out here. We started with 200 uh, from the, you know, over here, 200,000, but that's gonna go up because of net income less the dividends. So ending retain stockholders' equity is gonna be 225. And likewise over here, uh, the prior page shows us that there's 100,000 of stockholders' equity, but that's gonna go up by this increase in retained earnings of 28. So we're gonna have 128,000 here. So 28 divided by 128 gives us 21.9%. Wow, that's really good, isn't it? So we can see the advantages of issuing debt now. If we, now this would not be the case, it's not gonna be the case for return on assets, but for return on equity, uh, by issuing debt, it enabled a larger return to be possible for the investors. And again, this is very narrowly looking at only for the investors. So for the investors, we have this advantage and it's called financial leverage. By issuing debt, it levers or opens up a wider possibility for higher returns for the investors or the shareholders. 
Likewise, if things don't go well, there's risk there because it can also open up a wider percentage loss for the shareholder investors. So financial leverage, it does have risk associated with it, but on the upside, that risk creates a higher opportunities for the investors. Okay, so we've looked at the balance sheet, which gave the impression then that issuing stock was the better option because it had a positive impact on these ratios. But by looking at the income statement, we can see it increases retained earnings and it has a more positive impact on this particular ratio. But again, only on this ratio, return on equity. Only that ratio. Uh, let's go to the cash flow statement and look at what's going on. So if we look in terms of just cash, if we issue stock, cash will come in of 100,000 as a financing activity. We would pay a dividend of 10 grand. And uh, we would also, so again, we'd have cash coming in from selling the stock. We would pay a dividend of 10,000. There wouldn't be any interest because it's stock. And then the income taxes, let's see, let's go up here. Income taxes paid under operating would be 15,000. So uh, let's look at the net increase in cash then is 75,000 that's related to the common stock. That, you know, so I just looked at cash flows that were different because of issuing stock. So cash coming in from the stock, payment of the dividend and the income tax paid for the income tax expense will be different because of stock versus bonds. Let's go over to bonds. If we sell the bonds, we get $100,000. Uh, we don't pay dividends, but we will pay interest of $10,000. And then taxes this time is only $12,000. So total cash impacted because of the bond, cash will go up $78,000. So here again, we see the advantages of issuing debt because of the financial leverage. Okay, one last big overview then. What are the advantages and disadvantages of equity financing versus debt financing? So if I issue equity, um, equity stock doesn't have to be repaid, whereas if I issue debt, I have to pay back both principal and interest. Dividends are optional. I'm not locked into those. So there's just less risk here, less financial risk. Whereas, uh, but the disadvantages would be uh, we had change in stockholder control and dividends are not tax deductible and that creates advantages for the debt financing.